Well, welcome. Glad you're here. Hey, um, I asked a couple of people before church started. I have two copies of a $100 bill. And I asked them ahead of time. I said, what is the real and what is the fake? Which, one's, which one is a copy of a real $100 bill? And what is a copy of a fake $100 bill? And I'll show these to you after the service. But you know what? Most of the people I showed the copy to, they got it wrong. I purposely did a copy instead of the real one, uh, the real counterfeit and the fake counterfeit. A couple of years ago at our fireworks booth, someone passed us a $100 bill. It looked good. It passed the little machine, and it turns out that it wasn't real. It turns out it was a counterfeit. And then the bank decided, well, this bill doesn't work anymore, and so they gave it back to us, and we've had that thing ever since. And, and it works because it, you know, you will, well, how do you tell the real from the fake? You get to know the real, but if you only have a copy, how do you tell the real from the fake? If you only have something that's been passed on along the journey, how do you tell the real from the fake? Well, this morning we're going to start we're going to start talking a little bit about real versus fake religions. Real what, who is Jesus Christ? We're going to spin that truth today. And then we're going to after we learn about the real Jesus, in the next couple of weeks we're going to talk about what other people believe about Jesus. And and we're going to be able to compare that to Jesus Christ himself. We're going to compare that towards the word. And so it's important today that we set the foundation we go Jesus Christ, what are some important things about Jesus that we need to know so that as we compare what other people are teaching about Jesus, we can say, oh, that doesn't match the real thing. That is a, that is a counterfeit truth that we need to pay attention to. And we're going to start doing that in a couple of weeks. Next week, we have a fantastic guest coming, and, and his name is Steve, and, and he's a missionary, and Steve's going to be sharing with us. And I'm going to introduce him, and so we'll, we'll be here all together, and, and he's going to share about what what is going on in the world? He's out there. Um, he leaves the day after he comes here over to you, Poland to help with some of the refugees that are coming out of Ukraine and just has some fascinating stories about how God is using some very difficult times for his good. And he's going to challenge us to rethink what we mean by revival. All right? So rethink that. You know, the counterfeit, though, the counterfeit truth has been around for a very long time. It isn't something that just sprung up in the, in the, in the peace, love, and happiness 70s. It isn't something that, woohoo, yay, the 70s came, put a flower in the end of the gun and, and counterfeit religions. It's been going on for a very long time. The Apostle Paul writes, the Apostle John writes, he writes about it, not distinctly about it, but he, he's teaching some truth to counteract it in his first letter called 1 John. We'll get to that. And he's writing about this counterfeit if you will, this, this deceptive philosophy. There wasn't one particular teacher that was proclaiming it. It was just a way that people were starting to think, a way that people were being challenged to think, and, and they couldn't answer the questions, and so they made up some things that might seem reasonable based upon things that they were influencing into their time at that moment. And as we read at the beginning of 1 John, we need to remember, and please be cognizant, be aware mentally that the church that John's writing to, they didn't have the whole entire New Testament, all right? They didn't have all the Apostle Paul's writings. They didn't have the author of the Hebrews here, and they didn't have Hebrews. They didn't have Peter's writings. They probably, Gentile audience, they probably didn't have much of the Old Testament, and if they did, they probably didn't have access to it, you know? So we, we, need, to, we need to give them a little bit of slack as there were teachers coming in, and all they had some parts of the brand new church were the teachings of the apostles that they had heard, that they had seen, and that they had touched, and that's it. So, you know, as you just think through, what would it be like, what would you believe if you did not have the word of God with you? If you just had the teachings of a Sunday morning, and that's it. Came on a Sunday morning, you heard the word of God, and then you got to go out and live it out the rest of the week, what would you do? Well, there's a teaching being spread around called Gnosticism. And Gnosticism is, is, is in, was infiltrating the church back then. It said that matter is evil and that only the spirit is good. I like that little graphic because it has the word good, but behind it has all these evil words. It has hate. It has sin. It has wickedness behind it. And, and so that matter, matter is bad and the spirit is good. And, and so we begin to think through that and we go, salvation for them came from freeing the spirit from matter. So 
So what you would do is you would, how would you physically, you're physical and you have a spirit, how would you free your spirit from your body? How would you free physicalness, the physicalness of this place, to the spiritualness? Well, you would, you would go to some special secret spiritual knowledge people. I like this graphic right here, too, because that's what it would be. Okay, they, they open up the book, and then, then they climb up to the top of the mountain, and the person at the top of the mountain is that mystical spiritual guru, and it's been around since before the comic strips, you know, and, and people would say, you know, well, you got to find that person who has the special spiritual knowledge, and he will, he will dispense that special spiritual knowledge to you. Matter is bad. Spirit is good. So how did the Gnostics live with the result of the fact that matter is bad and the spirit is good? Well, they would do either or. They would do one or the other. They could live one way. <clears throat> one way they would live, would, they would say, well, if the body is evil, then you need to subject it to severe discipline. You know, fasting for 40 days in a row would be a good thing. Why? Because Jesus fasted for 40 days, and so you need to fast. You know, um, being super, super rigid in everything you see, do, and avoiding any possibility of evil. And, and staying away from anybody or anything that, you, that would walk in the way of evil. You could do that that way. You could be completely you know, separated from society and from culture, or, and most of you would choose plan B, or, because the body is evil, you could neglect and abuse the body. See, the spirit is good. The matter, the body is evil. And then, so it doesn't matter, if you will, what you do with your body. It doesn't matter what you do with your time. You can just go and you can engage in any kind of act, you could do anything, say anything. It wouldn't matter because it, you, you're never going to contaminate the spirit. The spirit is good. The matter is bad. And so you could go and live a complete crazy life. And you know what? It just wouldn't matter. I keep saying that. And I want to make sure that I keep saying that. So, so sin, it doesn't affect the spirit. Your spirit is good and sin doesn't affect it. Indeed, some say that... Um, <clears throat> It's just a great way that, that the more you indulge in sinful behavior, the holier you become, some people would even say, all right? And so John is writing this letter to this, and so, so then they also had ideas of what they teach about Jesus, what they teach about you. You could either, some would say, you got to go be completely separated, ostracize yourself almost away from everybody and everything, or just forget it and live a crazy lifestyle and, and it wouldn't matter because your spirit is good. So what did they say about Jesus? Jesus, was he truly here or truly not? They said this. They said that when Jesus was here, he was just a phantom. He, was, he wasn't really here. He was just um, an aberration, of we, what you will. It, it wasn't really a real person. It was just here. And, you know, so, so we, kinda, we can say, well, that's just goofy thinking, except for... In our very text that we have, in the book of Hebrews, it teaches us that we can do the same thing to angels. Hebrews 13.2 says, don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. And so, so we know that angels can take on the form of people. I've heard stories where, where someone all of a sudden just kind of, they're there and they help somebody through a, a moment. And when that moment is over, that crisis is over, they turn around and they give them thanks and that person is gone. Where did that person come? Where did they go? And so, so when we think of phantom, don't think of some slippery ghost whooshing through the building that you can barely see. And so that's what they taught. They taught that Jesus was just a phantom. The other thing they taught, if he wasn't just a phantom, then they, they pressed this as well. They said, well, his, the Spirit of God only temporarily resided on Jesus. Uh, the Spirit was only with him, and, and the Spirit of God only came on him, his perfect Spirit, when he was baptized by John in the Jordan. When he was baptized, then, then the Spirit came upon him. We know the dove ascended. Oh, this is my son, whom I'm pleased. And then, before the crucifixion, before the body died, whew, it left him. And so the Spirit never died. 
And so what do you do? How do you, how do you make that? And so that's what the Gnostics were teaching. They're trying to explain a very difficult question is how does God die? That's a, that's a, that's a very deep, thoughtful question. It's not something you can say, well, you know, he just dies. And when Jesus died, well, what happens? And so they're trying to explain it. They're thinking through this. And, and John says, well, I need to address these issues. And so John writes this letter in 1 John chapter 1. He says this, We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes, and we touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. What is John going against? <coughs> He's going against the idea that Jesus was a phantom. <coughs> Sorry about that. He says the things that we have heard and the things that we have seen. <coughs> I'm going to need a cup of water or a little. Amy, what's in here? <laughs> I'm going to feel good. <coughs> okay. Thank you for your sympathy cough. <clears throat> the things that we have heard and the things that we have seen, you know, our eyes touched and our hands have felt. <clears throat> he is <coughs> the word. <coughs> yeah, I went down the wrong place. <clears throat> okay, he is the word of life, right? And then John says, <coughs> we have seen him, our eyes, very physical in his description. He was revealed to us. He was in our presence. This isn't something that just, <coughs> I might have to give somebody else my notes. Tommy, get up here. No. Um, <laughs> you know, things that were revealed to us. We proclaim what we have actually, what does he say again? He's going against this idea that, that, that Jesus was just a temporary being. He's going against, and he's saying the things that we have seen and the things that we have heard. And our fellowship is with him. And then he says in verse 4, he says, we are writing these things so that you might share in our joy. Jesus Christ was real. He was here with us. He was revealed to us by the Father. He is here. And then he says in chapter 2, so you must remain faithful to what you have been taught from the beginning. So you must remain faithful. Don't deviate from the, from the stuff that other people are teaching you. Don't deviate from what you have heard from others. Stick to it. Stick to it. <clears throat> and so I'm going to talk about five real truths about Jesus that we need to be aware of. Five things. If you have your handouts, these are the beginning of the filling out of the handouts. The first one is that Jesus is the Son of God. That's the first truth that we're going to concentrate on. He is the Son of God. Because we're going to look at other people who talk in a couple of weeks who, who, who deviate from this truth. He is the Son of God. And in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, it says, The voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. The voice of heaven at the baptism, this is my son. Jesus is the son of God. The father saying, this is my son. And look at that. He is well pleased. <clears throat> Jesus hasn't healed anybody at this time. Jesus hasn't, hasn't taken and the leper isn't clean. He hasn't proclaimed a lot of truth. He hasn't gone out there and taught, confronted the the falseness of the Pharisees, and God was already pleased with him, his son. Jesus is God's own son. In John chapter 3, John writes this, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. We need to, we need to hold on to that. It's not like God has a whole bunch of kids up there. And, and he has this whole spiritual heavenly realm up there. And he says, oh, I'm just going to send Jesus. He's, yeah, I've got, I've got 50 sons. What do I care? Yeah, I mean, it's not even like Jesus has, God has two sons. Mormonism teaches God had two sons, the devil and Jesus. And, and so, you know, and so we got to really hold on to this truth. 
his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish. Hebrews chapter 1 says, In the past God spoke to our forefathers by the prophets at many times and in many ways. And in these last days he has spoken to us by his son. His son, God's son, whom he appointed heir over all things and through whom he made the universe. The son, Jesus Christ, is the radiance of God's glory the exact imprint of the divine nature. He sustains all things by his powerful word, the Son. Last week, we celebrated his resurrection. All right, because, and, and we said some profound things. Jesus rose from the dead. And now we're going to look at he is the Son of God. We need to really make sure that we understand he is the only son not like and, and it's not it, it's it's a triune nature of who god is it's not like it's not like matthew is my son he is my one and only son and it's true and so, and i don't have a, more than one son and matthew is my only son and this is not the paternal relationship of the, that kind of father son because then we're saying well god, god the father and well he birthed somehow he birthed jesus but truly god and truly jesus at the same time Okay, we've got to really understand the triune nature of God the Father, Christ the Son, the Spirit of God. All three working as one, are one, is one, and Jesus is yet called the Son. Jesus is God's only Son and was sent to earth by the Father. Make sure we understand that Jesus is God's only Son and he was sent by the Father to earth earth. He did it in obedience to the Father. Number two, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. Messiah uh, mean, uh, well, let me put this up. We just sang a song called Hallelujah. And to uh, many people in this room, Hallelujah is, is a word that we don't even know what it means. We think Hallelujah. Well, if you start to think about the word, what does Hallelujah mean? Just in a raise of hands, how many of you actually know the definition of what hallelujah means? Yeah, yeah, a, a tenth of the church. And we sang it with great enthusiasm, didn't we? Hallelujah. It, and the same with the word Messiah. We go, okay, Messiah means what? So hallelujah means praise the Lord, give joyful thanks. Hallelujah. When we sing those words, we're singing a different language, and now we need to understand it. it it's like Hosanna. We, we, two weeks ago, Two weeks ago, we sang the word, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we say, Hosanna, but a lot of times we don't even know what that means. <clears throat> Hosanna means, please save now or, or save now. Hosanna, hallelujah, Messiah. Messiah means anointed one. Messiah means anointed one, but not, not just any anointed one. Not just, okay, I anoint you with oil, therefore you're the anointed one. But it is the promised Messiah, the one who will restore and redeem and rescue Israel from all, or God's people from all of the trappings that they were in. They thought it was going to be a king. They thought it would be a king who would come in and, and conquer Rome and, and free Israel up. But God had to rescue them from something greater than the power of Rome, right? God had to rescue them from the power of sin and death, something significantly harder to do than just to free people from a nation. So, Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one. He is identified as the Messiah. Well, well he is identified as, was prophesied in the Old Testament, that there would be a, a Messiah. Let me give you some verses. Genesis 3.15, Genesis 12.3, Isaiah 7.14, Hosea 11.1, 1. Psalm 22 is a psalm, if you read it, and it looks at if it's almost written from the cross, you can read it and, and it talks about all the things that someone maybe from the cross could see. Isaiah 55, but he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. We see that Jesus, the Messiah, was prophesied in the Old Testament. There are lots of different verses about that. And Jesus fulfilled the prophecies. Oh, Bethlehem. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Nazareth. And my son will be called a Nazarene. We see all of those through his birth, death, and resurrection. 
Jesus fulfilled those prophecies. Luke 24, 44 says, And Jesus and he, Jesus, said to them, the disciples, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that was written about me in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms. Jesus is the promised Messiah. Number three, Jesus worked miracles. Have you ever asked yourself the question, why did Jesus work miracles? Why did he? Because he could have gone through, he could have argued with the Pharisees, he could have made the Pharisees mad, and he still could have been crucified on the cross and never done a single miracle. In fact, you got the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and in the Gospel of John, there are only seven miracles listed. I'll get to that in a second. So miracles aren't, aren't a big deal in the book of John. So why did Jesus do miracles? Why? And, and just go, well, they're there for a reason. Jesus healed. Jesus cleansed. Jesus did all these things for a reason. So throughout the Gospels, the works, Jesus did many miracles. In the Gospel of John, the miracles are supposed to push us toward belief. See, in the Gospel of John, the seven miracles are Jesus turned water to wine, he healed the official son in Capernaum. There was an invalid at the pool of Bethesda. He didn't heal all of the sick people at the pool. He healed the one person at the pool of Bethesda. He fed 5,000 people. Jesus walked on water. Jesus, in chapter 9, there's a great story of Jesus healing a blind man. The whole entire chapter is, is devoted to that story. And then finally, there's the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus, <laughs> come forth. You know, he doesn't have the story of the paralyzed man coming down through the roof. He doesn't have the story of Jesus spitting and healing the blind man. He doesn't have the story of, of a lame man walking, a deaf man hearing. He doesn't have any of those stories. Why? So that you would believe. But now, Jesus did many other miracles in the presence, but these are written. All it needs is seven so that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you would have faith, you may have life in his name. The miracles don't save you, church. It's faith in the person doing the miracles that saves. It, it, if the miracles didn't bring about salvation, because if they did, everybody there would have been saved. Everybody would have been saved. But not that many people had faith in the person doing the miracles. They just wanted to see a miracle. They, they just wanted to see him perform another trick. Uh, you know, or take care of their brother or their sister or their friend or their mom or their dad. They, they wanted to see the miracle and their faith was in the miracle, but it needed to be in the worker of the miracle. So the miracles that John uses are strictly to point to the person doing them. In Mark chapter 1, it says, And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this, a new teaching with authority? And he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. The miracles, they are a sign of Jesus' divinity and his power. They do absolutely represent his divinity and his power. And he has power over the physical body. He has power over the spiritual realm. He says to the demons, out, and they go. And it doesn't matter how many demons are there. They recognize his authority. He even says to death, loosen that grip. Lazarus, come forth. So they recognize his divinity and power, but they also teach us a very, very important point. They demonstrate his love and his compassion. Why does God do miracles? Because God loves us, and he was compassionate upon us. And they would call to him in their weakness. They would say, if I just touch the hem of his garment, having faith in him, not in the touch, she is healed. They trusted the one who could perform the miracle workers, not in the miracle itself, and they were saved. God has great compassion on you. I know there are multiple people, even in this room, and some listening online, who have been struggling with physical ailments 
all of your life for a very long time, and, and I don't know why God hasn't healed you, even though you've prayed for those miracles. You've prayed for that moment that God would restore your life to make it whole. It doesn't mean he loves you less that he hasn't done that. It just means that in the middle of that, you get this opportunity to trust him in some way that those of us who don't have those ailments don't have to. God loves us. He's completely compassionate on us. And, and don't let his lack of healing lessen your love. Number four, the fourth truth. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus' death on the cross was the perfect sacrifice for the sins of humanity. It's just this week, maybe read the book of Hebrews. And the book of Hebrews, it talks about the need for a sacrifice. Every year, every year the, the temple priest would offer a bull and goat, and, and they would do it year after year, proving that that sacrifice never satisfied God. But once, just once, Jesus Christ died for us, proving that his death was good once and for all. Once and for all. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no under name, under heaven, given among men, which we must be saved. You cannot be saved through the name of any other person. It is in the name of Jesus Christ that you are saved. You've got you to gotta, gotta grasp that. It is, it is him and him alone, the exclusive claim we'll look at next. It, it is him and him alone we are saved. Ephesians Chapter 2 says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is a gift from God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. In other words, you know what? You can separate yourself from society. You can live this aesthetic life where you just, you just go out and, and you say, oh, I'm not going to talk to anybody. I'm not ever going to go surf the internet. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to screen every call I have, and I've got to make sure I'm in a perfect mindset and my response is perfectly. No amount of good works will earn your salvation. No amount of doing every perfect deed will earn your way to salvation. It is only through God's grace that you are saved. Many of us need to hear that. <clears throat> We try to be good all of the time. And we go, well, if I'm just better, if I'm just better, then, then the blessings will come. God has already blessed you a thousand times over with Jesus Christ. That's how he's blessed you. And then you walk in obedience in your faith. But the blessing is eternal life in Jesus Christ. The blessing is the forgiveness of sins. The blessing is redemption. The blessing is salvation, church. That's what it is. Jesus' resurrection from the dead proved his victory over sin and death. He conquered sin on our behalf so that when we enter into God's presence and we are looking at him face to face, he's going to say, enter into my presence because I know you. You have a relationship with me. You're mine. And if you don't know him, then you don't have a relationship with him. And then you won't be, and then you'll be judged for every sin that you've done. And you'll be separated from God forever. That does not sound like a good place to go. Through his sacrifice, people can be forgiven of their sins and have eternal life. Through the death of Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice on your behalf, you can have eternal life. Now, now I struggle with this. Because in my, my class I was teaching on communications, a lot of students would talk about the need for exercises. Uh, and so they would do persuasive speeches on, okay, I want to teach you three reasons why you need to exercise every day. You need to exercise every day because well, it makes you feel good, it causes you to, use, to lose weight, and you know what? You're going to have a healthier life when you're 65, 70 years old if you exercise when you're 20. Yay, you know, that's great. But how many people who are 20 really care what they look like when they're 65? None of you do, right? None of you go, wow, this, you know, I'm, I'm going to resist that donut today because when I'm 65, I'm going to, how many times does that go through your mind? <clears throat> None. None. Not at all. You're going, 
Come on, let's be honest. You didn't think, well, some of you who are over 65 are going, eh, okay, <laughs> I'll eat that donut today then, yay. You know, and, and when we talk about eternal life, it's the same thing. It's like when, okay, well, if you do this now, you'll have eternal life. But eternal life, when is that? Well, when? If I don't do this now, then uh, eternal life is something ethereal. We're eth- what the eth- what the ethereal. ethereal for us to... Um, think through, and, and we don't get there. But we need to think through, how do we please him and honor him today? How do we honor him today? And we, you know what? You are headed in a direction. Are you going to have a relationship with God, and is it going to be a relationship, or is it going to be bound and constricted with rules that you can never please him because he's never quite happy with you because, well, every time you blow it, then you got to start over at zero again. There's no grace in that relationship. Eternal life, eternal joy starts today, and it continues for life. The gospel. Jesus died for us, paid the price for our sins, and we get to choose to have a joy-filled, obedient life with him from today on. This is the part that some people don't like, and we're going we're gonna to look at this in more detail. But Jesus is the way... Jesus is the truth, and Jesus is the life. Jesus is God's only son. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus worked miracles. Jesus is the Savior. And now the exclusive claim of that is he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And Jesus himself said, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No one, no one, no one comes to the Father except for through me. So, church, as we begin to look at what other counterfeit religions teach, we need to understand is that Jesus is the only way to God. Uh, And so we're going to hear other stories about how to get to God. Jesus is the only way to God. Jesus is the only source of truth. And we're going to spend some time, we're going to see that other people have written other sources that they call true as well. But Jesus is the only source of truth. And there's going to be some confusion from some of you. And we're doing this for a reason. We're doing this so that, so that when you go to your neighbor, you talk to your neighbor, you can have a good conversation with them. And you can begin to learn to love them. And you can begin to see where they don't quite see things the way that God's truth lines them up to be. And we can see number three, Jesus is the only way to eternal life. You're not going to get to eternal life any other way. Not by obeying a, a religious strict set of rules. That doesn't do it. <clears throat> not by living, living a wild, careless life. Who cares about what your body does because your spirit is clean. Jesus Christ is the only way to eternal life. You can't get there any other way. Jesus is the exclusive path to salvation. There are lots of different roads, but none of them lead to Jesus. Jesus is the exclusive path to salvation. I want us to begin to have a heart for people. I want us to begin to begin to learn to love people who who are on a a path away from Jesus. I don't want us to start condemning them. I don't want us to start um, jeering at them. I want us to really say, wow, there are our neighbors, and we we have churches close to this building that are teaching other things other than this. And so we need to be sensitive to how our neighbors live and how to have a good conversation with them. No one can come to the Father except for through Jesus. He is completely exclusive. So, what is our response to this? What is our response? And so, as I was putting this together, I said, this is great. We can, we can live here, and, and we'll kind of, okay, there are five truths about Jesus, and we'll have this great head knowledge, but what do we do with this? How do we then apply this? And so, I started to think about the pattern that is in the New Testament. And the pattern is this. The Apostle Paul will write a whole big treatise in in Romans. In Romans chapters 1 through 8 is is justification. We are justified. We are by grace. We are justified by faith, Paul will write. 
in Romans, and, and then in chapters um, 9, 10, and 11, he talks about how, how the Jewish people missed him, and he longs for the people, he, and he would give up his own salvation for them. And then in chapter 12, he turns the page, and he says, well, now how do we apply this? What difference does it make? And so Paul says our first difference is we must worship the Lord. We must worship the Lord. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Offer your bodies. Pretend in the morning that there's an altar you're going to wake up and go to. And the altar, you need to just put your place on itself on it and say, Lord Jesus, today I offer myself up to you. I'm a living sacrifice. Use me as you want. And it will, it will change your direction of that day. Will you wake up in the morning, give yourself a couple of minutes to wake up and, and go, Lord Jesus, today I offer myself, my thoughts, my words, my ways, my walk with you. It's yours today, Lord. Please, God, then. And then, then you get off that altar. Now you've dedicated your day to be a living sacrifice to please the Lord. Do not conform to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you would test and approve what is the will of God, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Don't go through your day thoughtlessly absorbing all of the things of the world, testing them, thinking through them, pondering them, and then making sure you understand what his good pleasing and perfect will is. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul does the same thing in Ephesians, first three chapters. Oh, you're saved by grace, absolutely. And, and complete grace is free. It's yours. Two beautiful prayers in there. And then in chapter four, he says, you know what? You need to know what you believe. As a prisoner of the Lord, Paul, writing from jail, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling into which you have been called. You're going to get up the altar and you're going to now walk in a manner worthy that you've been called today. I want you to live with all humility. Look at how you're supposed to live. Now you know this truth. You know who Jesus is. You know that he's the Messiah. You know that he's the Savior of the world. Now, how do you walk in light of it? In humility. God loves you. The God, the creator of the world, loves you, and it should humble you. Being patient. Bearing with one another in love. Husbands and wives, moms and dads, sons and daughters, bear with one another in love. Make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Be united with one another, encouraging one another, supporting one another. Church, may unity be a hallmark of who we are. May we be people who come alongside one another and bear one another up in love and share with one another. Philippians, Paul writes from a very challenging situation in life. He's in prison and he writes the most joyous letter he has. Some of you are going through some difficult times socially, economically, psychologically. You're kind of like you're in this prison, this mental prison and things aren't working well. And in that prison, Paul writes this joy-filled letter, and he says, finally, my brothers, a result of all the things I've been challenging you to do, rejoice. Finally, whatever is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, commendable, and if anything is excellent, if anything is praiseworthy, think about such things. What are you going to spend your day thinking of? What are you going to spend your time when you get off of that altar? You said, God, I'm, today is yours. I offered myself as a living sacrifice. I'm walking in. Poof, you're going, to, you're going to turn on your computer. You're going to open your phone. And are you going to be focused on things that are true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and commendable, excellent, and praiseworthy? Is that where your social media feed's going to take you? Probably not. Maybe then you need to say, well, I need to start thinking through how to think about things that are true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, praiseworthy. 
And, and then he says, dwell on the good. Think about those things. Studies show, I heard about this the other day, so I can't give you the source, that people who think about things that are true, honorable, noble, right, pure, level, they live a longer, happier life than people who think things constantly untrue, constantly ignoble, constantly un unpure. People live a longer, healthier, happier life, concentrating on those things that are pure and lovely and noble. And then, the most convicting side of this verse. You think about such things, and then you get to show them to other people. The things that you have learned, received, heard, and saw in me, keep doing. Keep doing. In other words, in other words, you're walking off of, of that altar this morning, and then you're going to go say, God, I'm a living sacrifice today. I'm going to think about whatever is people. And then people around you, you want them to follow your example. Uh-oh. Now we're getting intrusive. You want them to follow your example. See, he says the things that you saw in me. Would your... Do you like it if your son or your daughter copied your lifestyle? Would you like it if your brother or your sister followed your lifestyle? Your husband and your wife, your friends, your coworkers. We're talking about every thought that you have held captive in the name of Jesus. Keep doing them. Do it as an example that Jesus Christ has had an impact on you so that you may know the truth, and the truth would set you free. So church, in a minute, well, Edgar and the team are going to come lead us in the final song. And then after that, we're going to do a benediction. And when you do the benediction, I'm going to just invite people to come up and pray. Just come up, and if you need someone to pray for you, we'll pray for you right here. And then we'll be dismissed, and you're going to say, Lord God, use me today. Uh, I'm, I'm a living sacrifice, and so God, today... May this sacrifice be good for you. And at the end of the day, think through, did you walk in a manner worthy of the real truth? Think through, how did you walk today? Did you walk in a way that you want other people to follow? Wow. That's where this whole thing leads, so that you can lead other people into a personal relationship with Jesus, and they'll know it's real because they've watched you walk in it. All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for these men and these women and their love for you. Thank you for the encouragement and the support. So I pray for them, Lord, as they get ready to leave or to turn off the live stream. Lord, I pray that they would be people who would walk in a manner worthy of you. <clears throat> that they would be people who would dedicate themselves to the truth, to you, the source of truth. And as they do so, Lord, that you would honor and bless them and fill them with your presence and fill them with your spirit. Give them strength to do that today. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you very much for watching. There are just a couple of steps that we want you to take. And if you have your phone with you, just scan the QR code. Or if you're watching on your phone, simply tap on the link. The link will take you to a couple of things. One, a place to donate. It's always important that we're faithful in giving back to God. If he has blessed us, we're blessed to be a blessing. So we would ask you to give generously to the church. Two, to connect with us. Let us know who you are. Let us know who you are. And three, how to pray for you. We love to pray for you. And so we, uh, I can testify I've seen God work miracles. And so we'd love to see and join in prayer for you. Also, we'd love for you to come and visit. So just make way and come on a Sunday morning and visit. That way you get to see the live version of it instead of the live stream version of it and if you have any questions feel free to text those as well but make sure that you subscribe that becomes important to us and make sure that you also like this video the more people that like the video the more people it will reach so thank you very much for watching and have a blessed day